Uh, I remember my first job. You remember your first job? I remember my first job earning money. I worked at a dry cleaners when I was a kid after school. Uh, and then in the summertime, I would work all summer there. Um, and uh, the lady who owned it, her name was Mrs. Ladansky. She was tough. Mrs. Ladansky was a tough, tough boss. She uh, owned uh, K Cleaners and it was a big building. They did all the dry cleaning on the spot and I learned everything, there, you, know, everything you want to know about dry cleaning because I worked for her many, many uh, years after school and summers and so on and so forth. And uh, she was, as I say, she was tough. I started working for her for the princely sum of 35 cents an hour, which was the minimum wage back in 1960 uh, something in Canada, 35 cents. And then I got a raise to 50 cents an hour and I thought, wow, I'm living large now. 50, every hour I've earned half a dollar. It was, it was terrific. And Mrs. K, she didn't waste any money. Uh, each year she would say that as a bonus and a reward, she said, Mike, you've done a great job this year. After school you've been steady, working on Saturdays, all summer long, I can count on you. And as a reward for being a good employee, you are able to keep your job for another year. This, this was the bonus. I got to keep my job for another year. Well, thank goodness that times have changed and employers have become more sensitive to the needs of their employees. Uh, in order to reduce turnover, employers today are you know, beefing up benefit packages so that their people you know, are not lured away by other companies in this day of high competition for qualified workers. You know, today, a lot of companies offer uh, benefits like uh, on-site uh, daycare, childcare, very important. Uh, pension plans, of course. Some companies even provide you know, workout rooms in their corporate offices for their employees uh, to use, all kinds of things. Uh, this generation, millennials, very mobile, and companies have learned that a key selling tool to hire and keep top people is to provide the kind of well thought out benefits that will earn uh, a long term uh, employee loyalty uh, that a company needs to prosper. It's not profitable when a company has too many turnovers. It's important to keep employees. So with this in mind, this idea in mind, I want to review, you're wondering, what does Psalm 103 uh, have to do with, uh, with this? Well, in Psalm 103, um, it's a psalm that actually outlines the type of benefits that an employee of God has. In other words, God provides a certain benefit package for all of those that serve Him faithfully. So as I say, open your Bibles to 103, Psalm 103, and let's review the kind of benefits that we as Christians can enjoy as employees, servants, if you wish, of the Lord. Now, as far as Psalms are concerned, this particular Psalm was a Psalm of thanksgiving written by David, the King of Israel. And so let's just jump right in here and see what kind of benefits that God provides for His people. Uh, we read in verse one and two, David says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of His benefits. None of His benefits. So David begins with a sort of a self-talk to focus on the good things that God has given him. And he's thankful for these things. He's thankful for these benefits that he has as a child of God. He even exhorts himself to stay focused on these things as a way of remaining positive. In the next verses, he describes four main things that God provides him, four benefits, if you wish, that God provides. You could say that these are the four main items in any believer's benefits package. And so the believer's benefits package begins with number one, purification. That's the first benefit, purification. Let's read verse three and four. He says, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. And so David says, one of the benefits that we have is that God forgives, yes, He forgives, but He forgives all of our sins. All of our sins are forgiven. And He saves us from the eternal consequences of those sins. 
What a great benefit. You know, I put the line under, He forgives all our sins. We kind of know, you know, God forgives sins. And sometimes we choke on the one sin perhaps that's been in our lives that you know, even we have trouble forgiving ourselves for. Some either incredibly stupid thing or some incredibly evil thing that we've done, disgusting thing, whatever. You know, it's like, wow, I, you know, I don't know if I could even forgive myself for doing that. It certainly shows up in our lives because so many people that I talk to that you know, need counseling you know, for these type of things, they go back to a thing that they just can't get over. It's in the past, you know, whatever it was. And yet David says here that God forgives all of our sins. They're all, they're all covered. What a great benefit. Now David doesn't describe how God does this, but we as Christians, we know, don't we? Jesus' blood is the price paid for our sins. His life is what redeems or buys back our life from condemnation. Marty, what a great and enthusiastic sermon. He was, a, he was ignited by the, by the gospel, the idea of the resurrection this morning, and why not? That's a powerful idea. Jesus' blood is, is paid for our sins. The disease that we suffer from, you know, that he talks about, he's not talking about cancer, He's talking about the diseases we suffer from uh, because of sin. The disease is death, that's the disease. And resurrection is the cure. And we receive this cure from Christ. How happy would you be to work for a company that said to you, oh, part of your benefits package, you're healed of all your diseases. You know, that heart trouble you've got, you're okay. You know, that blood sugar that's like at around 300, it'll be around 80. As soon as you start working for us, it'll be down around 80. Your blood pressure's going to be normal. The cancer you had in your throat, that's gone. What? You'd say, are you kidding me? I want to work for you. Well, David is saying one of the benefits that we have in being a child of God is that God heals us of our greatest illness, disease, which is death. Because of sin, we were justly condemned to die and suffer eternally. Because God sends Jesus, the curse of death, that disease that we suffer from, is replaced with what? A crown, he says, of mercy, a crown of love. And so God provides, uh, excuse me, so God purifies us through the blood of Jesus Christ and because of this, we are saved from death. That's the, that's the first benefit in our Christian's benefit package. The second item in the passage, in the, in the package, is provision. Provision, let's read verse five. He says, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like an eagle. Provision, he provides. Of course, David could look back at the history of the Jews, especially the exodus from Egypt, and see how God provided for his people in a miraculous way. For 40 years their clothes didn't wear out, their sandals didn't wear out, they had enough food and water to drink, they had protection from their enemies for, for, for four decades. And David, of course, in his own life, he knew how God had provided for his safety and his work throughout his years on earth. The idea here is not just that God provides, but rather that when you recognize that it is God Himself who provides for you, that knowledge right there has a regenerating effect on your soul. See what I'm saying? It's not just that God provides, we, we, put, the, we put the accent on provides, oh, I'll get the things that I need. It's not, that's not where David is putting the accent. He's saying it's God who provides. It's one thing, it's when the government provides, or my boss provides, or my savings account provides. You know, the, yeah, that's a sort of provision. But here he's saying, God is the one who provides. And the idea that God is the one who provides brings us comfort, gives us energy, encouragement. So a great benefit for a Christian is not only that God will provide, but also that the continual knowledge and confidence of this fact gives us courage and hope on a continual basis. When I'm down, when I'm frightened, when I'm not sure, when I'm confused, I need to remember, hey, God is the one who's providing for me. Why should I be afraid? Why should I be worried and, 
and concerned about these things. So I have a hope that everything will work out because it is God Himself who will provide for me. The third thing that God provides in the benefit package, protection. Protection, verse six and seven, he says, the Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He made known His ways to Moses, His acts to the son of Israel, sons of Israel. You know, David is saying here, you're not alone as a child of God. You're never left unprotected. And here's the important thing, you're never left without justice. Without justice. Sooner or later, you will receive justice. You know, we watch television and the news, I mean, it's just so discouraging. The things that we see, another you know, suicide bomber, this time in, uh, was it in Pakistan? You know, 60 Christians, did you know that? Just happened. Christians meeting, you know, because there are Christians in India, there are Christians in Pakistan, Christians meeting in a park to celebrate Easter. And a suicide bomber got among them and you know, blew himself up. And with him killed 60 Christians and hundreds of people um, uh, were wounded. When you look at the news, you know, what is it, two days ago another bomb went off of there and then a week ago something else is going on and then the, you know, the Russians are, are dropping bombs on civilians and the, the Syrian uh, leader is, is massacring his own people. I mean, it's so discouraging. It's so discouraging if you are one of those victims or if you are a loved one of one of those victims and there's nothing you can do about it. How are you going to get even with Mr. Putin? Or how are you going to get even with Assad? the leader of Syria who's dropping barrel bombs on his own people. How are you going to get even with those people? How are you going to get even with that suicide bomber that blew himself up in the, in the, in the airport and, and killed all those innocent people? Well, you're not going to get even. You won't get justice in this world. But one of the benefits of a child of God is that God guarantees that you will receive justice. You will receive justice for every unfair, unjust, inappropriate oppression that you have to suffer as a child of God. Those 60 Christians who were murdered there just recently, today or last night, those 60 people may never receive justice from the courts or anything like that but they will receive justice one day because God promises that He will execute justice on behalf of, of His people. You know, the benefit is not that we have protection. I mean, nothing protects us from you know, getting cancer or heart attack or getting run over by a car. Nothing really protects us against that. The benefit is that we have God's protection so that perfect justice will be guaranteed to those who oppress us. Now that's not something you, know, you can take in the bank and you know, that's not a warm and fuzzy type thing. But if you've been the victim of something, if you've, been the, if you've been victimized in some way, if you've been treated unfairly, if you're the victim of a crime or some sort of, uh, uh, you know, some sort of oppression, then this benefit, is, this benefit is very comforting and very encouraging. Because no matter what happens here, you know one day God will execute justice for you personally. That will happen. And so the Christian's benefit package, as I say, purification, provision, protection, and then the fourth element of God's benefit package that uh, David talks about, promise, promise. We have purification, provision, protection, and a set of promises or guarantees from God. You know, in a regular job, there are really no absolute guarantees, right? No matter, even if you work for the government, everybody thinks that's the safest job in the world, but even if you work for the government, things happen. Normally, so long as, you know, if you're in a business, the business is going well and you do your job properly, 
Yeah, you get to keep your job. You know, some people think the safest job here in Oklahoma is you know, working out at Tinker. It's a great job, you're safe, you know, blah, blah, blah. But if, if you've lived in Oklahoma for a while, there was talk of shutting down Tinker a while back, a couple of, couple of years ago. People didn't feel very safe then. Everything was based on the whim of some politician in Washington. But David here, he mentions three promises that God makes which are not subject to change no matter what happens in this world. So the first of the promises, the promise of mercy. Verse eight, he says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will He keep His anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. One of my benefits as being a child of God is a promise of mercy from my God. And David describes that promise by describing the character of God. You know, the bottom line in, in God's dealing with us is not money or profit or how much you produce. His bottom line is compassion and mercy and patience and loving kindness and graciousness and generosity. That's his bottom line. David says that God does not deal with us on the basis of law or justice. In other words, if He dealt with us on the basis of law or justice, then our treatment would be based on our performance, how well we have performed. David explains that God treats us with compassion and love and patience. I mean, if you were in trouble, you know, who would you rather face to judge you? Um, a court-appointed judge or your grandpa? <laughs> Wouldn't you rather have your grandpa there to judge you? That's what David is saying here. You have a promise of mercy and compassion. It's built in. It's a wonderful relief to know that this is the context in which God sees us and He will treat us when we come before Him. Second promise is the promise of understanding. Read with me, verse 11, he says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His loving kindness toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. For He Himself knows our frame, He is mindful that we are but dust the promise of understanding. In this passage, David explains why God treats us the way that He does treat us. He does so because He truly understands our weaknesses and He really understands and knows our history. In other words, God knows why we do what we do. A lot of times we don't even know why we do what we do. You know, we say to ourselves, well, I wouldn't do that thing again. I reacted in this way. What's wrong with me? I don't, I don't understand myself. But the beauty of God's promise is that the one who judges you, God, He understands you. He knows why you do what you do. He knows all of the twists and turns that have brought you to where you are in your life today. Things you've forgotten about, how you were treated, how you were raised, you know, uh, 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 shocks to your system when you were, He knows everything. For those who read David's Psalm when it was actually written, it was a great relief to know Almighty God was this kind of God. Among the pagan nations, you know, it was an age where the concept of God was not much more than He was a kind of a human and more times than not an animal or a mindless and cruel force only to be appeased but never appealed to. You didn't appeal to Molech. You didn't appeal to Molech. You gave your firstborn child to Molech in the fire. So David here describes a God who promises his children that he will deal with them merciful, mercifully. Why? Because he really understands 
the sinful human condition and the things that have brought us to where we are today. And then thirdly, David says a third promise, and that is a promise of faithfulness. Verse 15, as for man, he's, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind has passed over it, it is no more, and its place acknowledges it no longer. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him, and His righteousness to children's children, to those who keep His covenant and remember His precepts to do them. Despite man's weaknesses and sure death, God will not let him be erased and eliminated like you know, dead grass and flowers. How many people in the world think that life is like that? You, know, you live, you die, you're in the ground like a dog, nobody remembers you, you, you're aware of nothing. They think that's what happens after death. But God promise, promises to keep us alive. Those who trust Him, those who obey Him, David mentions this word, you know, his loving kindness. He says it several times. And again, in this passage, as the motivating characteristic behind all of the promises that God has made, it's his loving kindness. The word loving kindness in Hebrew referred to a special quality in God's loving character. It was the ability to remain faithful to an agreement between two people even when the other person failed to remain faithful. What an interesting characteristic this is about God. Loving kindness described God's willingness and His ability to remain true to His promises even when we are undeserving of them. True to the thing that He's promised us even when we don't live up to our side of the bargain. And so God promises us mercy he promises us understanding and faithfulness. Again, the value of these promises is not simply what is being promised, but who is making the promises. What a tremendous benefit to know that God Himself is the guarantor of the benefits that we have been promised. They're sure things. Now in the final verses, David summarizes all that he has said by declaring the true reality for man. Go to verse 19. He says, the Lord has established His throne in the heavens and His sovereignty rules over all. And so the true reality is that this is God's world and He rules above all. I know it's easy to forget that, while we're sitting in these pews listening to the various teachers and preachers, it's kind of easy to remember, oh yeah, God's in charge because we sing about it and we talk about it, we pray about it. But it's not so easy to keep that in mind as we go back out into the world and we're watching the news and listening to the newspapers and you know, it doesn't sound like God is in charge. It sounds like the politicians are in charge. Like the ruthless dictators, they're in charge. Or, or Hollywood's in charge. That's what it sounds like. But the true reality is this is God's world and He rules above all. This is meant to reinforce the idea that the package that we are offered is offered by the only one who can guarantee it and all that it contains. Let's keep reading till the end. He says, bless the Lord, you His angels, mighty in strength, who perform His word, obeying the voice of His word. Bless the Lord, all you His hosts, who serve Him, doing His will. Bless the Lord, all you works of His, in all places of His dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So in these final verses, David returns to the form of his opening statement by encouraging everything in existence in the spiritual world as well as in the physical world to bless and praise God for all of the things that he has mentioned. And he finishes the psalm with the kind of a bookend verse which he used to begin the psalm. He begins the psalm with, bless the Lord, O my soul, and then he finishes the psalm with, bless the Lord, O my soul. That's why you call a bookend. You know, same thing that starts and finishes the psalm. Now, the beauty and the power of the psalms 
is that they speak to us with the same impact today as they did when they were written nearly 3,000 years. 3,000! 3,000, you think about that for a minute, not, not three centuries ago or three decades, we think, oh boy, World War I, that, wow, that was like back, that was 100 years ago, whoa, you know, World War I. This is written 3,000 years ago. It's fresh, like spring flowers, it's fresh, like bread baked and coming out of the oven, it's fresh. And why is it this way? You know when they say the living Bible, the living word of God, why is it fresh? Because it's alive, that's why. And it's alive because God Himself speaks to us through David's writings and He says the exact same thing to us today. That for those who believe and obey Him, which for us today means following Jesus Christ. For those people, God offers these guaranteed benefits in His, what we call, benefits package. One, purification through the blood of Jesus for every sin, all sin, forever. It never comes back. Provision through prayer in His name. What does Jesus say? Ask me, He said, anything you ask in my name. Ask. Protection for His church and the guarantee of justice. Why is it, do you think, we can forgive 70 times seven? You ever wondered why? Why is it, do you think, that we can turn the other cheek? Why is it, do you think, that you know, if we're spoken against, we, we need to keep silent and to return good for evil? Why is it, do you think, that God tells us, go ahead and do that? Well, he tells us to go ahead and do that because he knows that justice will prevail one day. You go ahead and turn the other cheek, I'll take care of this guy. You go ahead and do that second mile, I'll take care of this guy. You go ahead and return good for evil, I'll take care of this guy. That's why we can do that. As a matter of fact, if we could just get to a little higher plane, instead of just turning the other cheek, if we could get to the point of actually praying for that person, why? Because that person is under the judgment of God and the only thing that can save him is our prayer for that person. That's why. So we receive purification, provision, protection, the promise the promise of mercy and understanding and fidelity for all who confess His blessed name. Is there anything grander? Is there anything better? Is there anything more valuable? Is there anything else to give our life to? And so the invitation almost you know, speaks for itself tonight. If you don't have this benefits package in your life, then as always, we encourage you, confess Christ if you haven't, be baptized if you haven't, be restored if you've wandered away, come for prayer if you need strength to, uh, uh, to apprehend these benefits and to keep them clear before you.